Hi guys and welcome to Confetti's Industry Week. I hope you had a great first day and have enjoyed your guests so far today. For our final talk of day one, uh, we are catching up with 3D artist Rue McNeil, who will be talking to you about what it takes to become part of the VFX world. With some tips and tricks and things to avoid that Rue has learned over the years that have gained him the skills needed to get his name in the credits. Before we begin, a quick reminder to use the link in the chat function uh, for all of your questions and we'll be catching up with those at the end of the talk. Uh, don't forget that you can still book on to upcoming guests for the rest of the week by uh, navigating to industryweek.confetti.ac.uk. As part of Industry Week, we're running a competition where you can also win lots of cool stuff. Uh, all you have to do is tag us on Twitter and Instagram using IW21, sharing your experiences throughout the week. We hope you enjoyed today's sessions and a massive thank you to Rue for joining us uh, today on our 15th Confetti Industry Week. Uh, I'll now hand you over to Rue. Thank you. Hello there, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm just going to get my screen sharing on here. So I'm going to get started with the talk. Make sure audio is on. Okay, so just to double check, you can see the screen there and everything, yeah, okay? Yep, okay. So uh, my name's Rudy McNeil, um, but most people call me Rue, because uh, you can see by the sp uh, spelling, it can be a bit of a nightmare. And with the industry I work in, it's mostly international uh, teammates I have, so just makes life easier. Um, I always cover it as well, um, slightly different with us being online, but normally in person, people always ask why I wear the sunglasses. Um, partly desperately trying to be cool, but mostly because I'm colorblind and these help my vision. So if you ever see me with them, it should explain it for you. Um, so to, just to cover it as well, and just because I know there's been a lot of talks online, so just in case you think it's just another random person online who doesn't really have any backing or anything to be able to talk to you today. Um, this is a kind of list of projects that I've worked on. Um, now, before working on these, I got kicked out of high school, got kicked out of college and uni, and um, ended up spending most of my time couch surfing because uh, I ended up being homeless due to a lot of silly decisions. Um, so when I'm giving you advice today, it's not me trying to be like stay at home, like, stay in school kids. It's like just genuinely good advice because uh, I've made pretty much every mistake you can make. Um, and this is one you should definitely avoid just to make your life a lot easier. A quick overview to start with, we'll go over roughly what I would say um, VFX is, because it's a very, very broad topic. Now, fortunately, there's this lovely slide that I found, which I like to use. It's credited at the bottom if you want to go and find the original poster of it. Um, so it starts off with the pre-production side of things. So this is where you want to go in if you're kind of like an ideas person. Maybe you're not the most artistic person in the world, but you just like ideas, story writing, planning. There's a whole section of VFX just dedicated to that, which I think often gets overlooked by the kind of cool side that I work in. Um, there's the production side of things. Uh, that's the side where which I take part in. Um, so this is where you get all the, the actual kind of meat and potatoes of it. Uh, but this would essentially wouldn't work at all without any of the pre-production side of things. We essentially just take what they've got and try to make it into a vision. And then if you want to be essentially the kind of person who gets to go sit in like magazines and gets to go to all the cool events and be famous your post-production area is more what you'd like to aim to be in because you're essentially in charge of what the final look of a project will be and you see like the color correction the, the compositing and everything you take all the other elements and put them together and again this is not um a part of this can be not needing to be quite so artistic this is more a technical side of it uh, I've, I've met a lot of people who are worried because they're not world-class artists that they can't do VFX. Total nonsense. There are endless directions to get into. As long as you just follow something that interests you, you'll find a way in. Um, and this is why I always cover it, because VFX always kind of brings to mind ideas like the huge monsters fighting, buildings collapsing, bringing back dead actors, that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of the time, it ends up being completely different from that. Um, the best ideas in the world mean absolutely nothing if you don't have the right planning and um, the right people in the right places and even even like the biggest budget it's it doesn't count for anything if it's done badly um so there are four boxes that i find you can tend to put any film into um, it's a bit of an oversimplification but it's a very easy way to look at it if you're planning on making a film yourself even like a, um like a student short film this is a some super quick things to think about so there's the film Birdemic. If you've never seen it, I'd highly suggest watching it. It is one of the worst B-movies ever made, but it's so bad, it's incredible. Um, and this is kind of one angle of it. If you know you don't have the budget or if you're not going to be able to make a high-level production, make it comedic. I mean, I don't know if that's what they were going for, but it's certainly what they've achieved. And just through its humour, it's become famous. Um, you've got kind of the king of them all, Scorpion King, some of the worst CG, I think, that's ever been committed to film. Um, 
this film had all the budget in the world, but this is where I was saying about the planning. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. This was not planned properly. It wasn't thought out, kind of squeezed in at the end. And yeah, this kind of speaks for itself. Um, there's a third one. I generally try and avoid as much as possible, but it was possible. Um, but it gets used a lot in films, which is kind of like the Beowulf. We went with the, the, the temptress thing of the, the CG is pretty good, but there's an uncanny value there. So there's that oddity to it. So they have to show in something to try and tease it, to try and distract you. Cause um, I mean, as nerds, we're generally pretty distractible, um, but this is a cheap trick and it's totally obvious when you do it. So try and avoid it like the plague. And I'd say the best one is Blade Runner 2049. This is, I'd say like the benchmark for VFX today. Um, it's an unfortunate side of our job that if you're doing it as good as you should be doing it, nobody should even be able to see it, which can be a bit of a, a, a kind of a weird thing to get your head around spending two years of your life working on something to make sure that nobody can see it. But it, it comes with time. So I'm just going to play this video here quickly. When I was showing the Scorpion King and the idea of the bad planning, this was for uh, The Matrix Reloaded, made at the same time as The Scorpion King, similar budgets, same technology. Um, but vastly different results. The part of the process that involves getting the expression performance is perhaps the most complex in which the actor needs to, in a, in a somewhat restrained uh, situation, uh, provide an emotional sort of facial expression which is captured in process and assigned on an individual basis. For some time, we were speculating whether we wanted to try any scenes with articulate speech in close-up shots with CG humans. And there were discussions that I was having with Larry and Andy about possibly taking the shot where Smith says more and making that fully virtual. But, you know, as, as applied strictly for action beats, it was not necessary to apply articulate speech. However, the technology is there. So when I see that in comparison to stuff from the Scorpion King, it kind of makes it even more laughable. This is about the only video of that I could find, and I think it's in like 360p on YouTube somewhere. There's not even a high-res version of it, and it still looks better than the finished like DVD you can buy of Scorpion King. Um, so get that kind of the boring stuff out of the way. So more into what it's actually like to be a VFX artist. Because um, when you first study or start learning, wherever you go about it, um, you're going to drive yourself into the ground. It's the, the one of the bad side effects of this kind of a role is it's a, it's a passion job. Um, so you will end up just going like two days in a row without sleeping, loaded up on coffee and Red Bulls and thinking it's the best idea in the world. Um, it's an absolutely terrible idea. It's one of those ones that it's kind of impossible to get across to somebody. It's like that, you know, the, the old thing of like a, a parent telling a child not to do something. They don't listen, then they learn it themselves. And that's how you get the lesson across. That's exactly how this goes. So my, my main advice would be um, any promises or work that you say you can do, just make sure that you wake up and kind of clap at the right time. That's essentially how I managed to get myself through. It was still working stupidly, but just making sure that I was cognitive enough when I needed to be. Um, I'll go a bit more into why it's a bad idea later on. Um, but this is just to quickly cover why it's worth because it initially VFX sounds like kind of a negative career, but it is one of the most awesome ones. Um, because we will be sitting in the studio and you get the hands on with props, you get to meet actors, there's directors there. Um, it is really one nice thing if you're having a particularly bad day looking at wonderful actors on screen and you've got one of the suits that they've been filming on sitting beside you to recreate in 3D. Um, nothing smells quite as bad as neoprene that's not been washed for like nine months and filmed in. So when you see the glamorous actor on TV and you know what they actually smell like, it makes your day a whole lot better. Um, but what I'd say is kind of like the, the moment I find that most people, when they first have that kind of, it's all been worth it moment. So you'll be sitting in the cinema screen at the end of a movie, everyone's gone, the, the folks will be in cleaning up popcorn and stuff. Um, and, you know, someone asks you, what are you doing there? Or like it's kind of awkward because you'll be sitting with your phone out recording, which of course you're not meant to do, but at the end of the film, it's, it's like weird gray space in there. Um, but you'll have that moment when your name appears in the credits and that's when you're kind of like to the popcorn guy, like, yep, yeah, that's why I'm sitting here. And it's normally at the very, very bottom of the list. It'll be like below the caterers and the music and everything. It's at the very end. And a fun bit is quite often you don't know if your name's going to be in the credits until you sit into the watch the end of the film. Um, it can be a lottery. 
So uh, like a company will be given a set amount of names that are allowed to put in. And then it's say there's 500 people, but 200 spaces. You have to just wait for two years until you watch the film to find out if you won or not. So that can be can be interesting. Um, you'll also get to take part in super widescreen photos where it kind of becomes like where's Wally because it's uh, nobody knows who's in there. And I can guarantee that waiting for like to load this up in your phone with like terrible internet in a pub, people really don't appreciate it. So this is gonna keep it to show the family. Now I'd say into some actual advice here, your portfolio is your most important thing in VFX. Um, studying 100%, you need to do it as important. Um, I'd say with the, the, the way that I've gone about learning without going to uni, I'm probably about two or three years behind where I should be. Because when you teach yourself something, you essentially only learn the stuff you want to and the boring stuff you don't want to learn, you kind of ignore. Whereas university, whether you want to do it or not, will make you do it. Super useful. Um, so my old portfolio, because I quite often get asked by people, um, they kind of ask, how did you get started? Because there's this kind of weird assumption, I think, when you see somebody in a professional role that you think they must have always been good. And it's totally not true. And unfortunately, because the internet never seems to delete anything, I keep finding my old portfolio, no matter how much I try to get rid of it. So if hopefully what I'm trying to do with this is show you some of my older work, some terrible stuff to try and you know make you feel like even if you're if you're worried your things aren't good enough, it could certainly be worse compared to some of these. So these are some of my original sending out to companies main portfolio pieces, um, which pro tip, if you're going to put words in a picture, make sure you're even spelling them correctly. This was meant to be the singing bush and it became the signing bush, but I was 3 a.m. loaded up on coffee, didn't notice it. Um, and these were models that were super quick and really roughly badly done um, because I was unfocused essentially. And I decided that elephant in the top left-hand corner there was the best piece of VFX art that had ever been created. So I decided to make a, a composite of it. And I, I used this for an application to try and get a job at Pixar, um, which as you can tell by the composition, didn't work too well. Because uh, unfortunately, instead of looking at this and thinking, how am I gonna make it proper? I asked my mom if she thought it was cool and she thought it looked cool. So that was good enough for me. So this is a very, very important point. Even if your mum thinks it looks cool or whatever, um, ask somebody who doesn't like you or somebody who does, has, has no reason to sugarcoat life for you. Because um, now looking back, thinking that I sent this for a job application, it's it's pretty embarrassing. Like I, I don't know what I thought like adding Lemsip into a photo was going to do to help me get a job. But at the time, I guess it made sense. And I bring this up because when you join VFX, we go to things called dailies, which is like a miniature cinema screen. So imagine like a 100, 150 inch cinema. Um, in that room is everybody working with you, the producers, and normally like the CG or the VFX soup. And your work will be up there. It'll go in a 360 every morning. And they will sit there with laser pointers and they will rip your soul apart from everything that you've done for the day before. And the first couple of times you go through it, it sucks because you're so used to being told that your stuff's amazing by your friends. Um, but this is how you improve. So like, if, this is why we do it every morning to make sure that the work we're producing is the best that it can possibly be. So I'd suggest you now, like as soon as you possibly can, start putting stuff on like Reddit or whatever, somewhere where people will not be gentle to you. So you can start getting used to that feeling of your work being ripped apart. And so you can improve, super important. Um, also, control how much you're making. In my original portfolio, I've got four pages of substandard work because I was very much of the opinion if I had more stuff, it was way better. Whereas it's in fact, the less better stuff you have. Like, no, if I have like five models which are really, really good, it hands down beats four pages of terrible models any day of the week. So yeah, the, the four pages there is how I used to apply for jobs. And now if I'm applying for a job, I essentially send four pictures. Um, normally there'll be a showreel, but I like to have kind of four images that I used as eye catchers. And what I've, a quick thing to do, it's a really simple way of like whittling down your work because sometimes it can be hard to do a cull on your own stuff because you quite, you know, you quite, um, you care for it because you made it. Um, I put my stuff on a social media platform, whichever four images get the most likes, those are the four I pick. It's super easy crowdfunding way of figuring out which are your best works. I don't know how foolproof it is, but it's this is the way I go about it. Um, now, what I'll show you as well is I've got two ways of applying. I have the previous ones there. These, if I'm applying for a freelance worker or something like that, 
Um, if I'm applying for something professional, I have a professional reel. So I'll just play that for you quickly just now. Now, some of the stuff, just uh, as a heads up, the Wonder Woman stuff, um, because the film's not uh, come for its full breakdowns and everything yet, a lot of this is placeholder. But this will give you an idea of what my finished reel, my updated one's going to look like. So just as a heads up, that reel is what I would class as too long at the moment. This is my rough cut, so I need to shorten that down. It's just essentially uh, quite hard to break down kind of 12 years of work into two to three minutes. Um, now, an important thing as well is when you're when you're doing a reel like that is to cut it to music. Um, so I, I always cut my reels to some music, but what you got is just to keep the timing and the flow nice. But um, when your reel gets reviewed, there's a good chance it'll be on mute. So your song doesn't have to be brilliant, but I would just suggest cut it to something. Um, I was watching a lot of retro movies that night, so that's what ended up happening there. Um, now, this is a comparison to my previous portfolio. This is my new full one. Um, I try to never have more images in it than this, um, because if you have too many, it just becomes kind of diluted. So what I'll normally do is every month or so, I'll go in and make sure that there's no fluff or junk in there. And if there is, I just delete it. Um, there's no point in keeping stuff around if there's no use to you because essentially this is your your kind of reputation in the world. Um, so you want people's first find of you or how they see you to be as good as it possibly can be without them having to filter through everything. Um, so what I've, oh.
I played that one a little earlier there. I forgot to read the note beforehand. But the idea of that one is this was uh, when I was talking to a couple of students, when I was showing them my demo reel portfolio, um, a big thing that they worry about is they don't have a body of work to use as a demo reel, which I can remember when I got started desperately trying to put something together to make it work. Um, so what my, my main goal with that one was, is if you have one model or if you only have a couple of things that you've made, just find a cool way to show them. Um, I, I love to model completely overly detailed, complex things that you'll never get to see half of them. So if you're a modeler, show off your modeling. So that I decided it'd be a great idea to animate it or building together, which about two days in I discovered wasn't such a great idea because I'm not an animator, but you get something cool at the end. Um, but it's more the tip there is if you don't have a lot of work, just take one thing and really find a cool way to show it off. Um, which leads into this. Again, if you've only got one model, this is an example here, just is this one model of the same shoe, um, but customize it to like the company you're applying for. It's a super, I don't know, it, it seems kind of cheeky and it's a super simple thing to do. But the way to think about it is a large company is going to receive 100 plus applications every day for people who want to work there. Um, and a lot of the time, it's not based on just your work. It's just there's a huge pile of applications and maybe your one's in the bottom of the list. It's just bad luck. So you've got to keep applying. Um, so I find this is a good way to kind of do an eye catcher. Um, just the same model, literally just change one color, put the company logo on it. It looks like you've spent a lot of time making this customized application. And then 10 minutes later, you change the color, different logo, different application. Um, it's it's quite effective, I found. I mean, it's, it's got me work before. Um, and it's a good way if you're worried about not having enough stuff in your portfolio to really quickly bolster it up. Um, you can do like color schemes. And if you're a designer, it'd be a good way to show off all that kind of stuff. Um, now, really important thing though, no matter what it is that you're putting out or, or showing, you've got to show you're working. So um, not just for like the math side of things, I hated that phrase, but it's the only way to pass your grades. Um, but if you're a modeler, for instance, you need to have wireframe in there. If I'm looking at a portfolio and I don't see any wireframe in the thumbnails, I don't even open the portfolio because I don't have the information there that I need. Um, this shows me how you work. So this is what I need information wise if you're going to get hired. It'd be the same as you're a textured artist, show your maps. There's no point in just showing the finished render because there could be post-processing and all sorts of Photoshop and stuff in there hiding like kind of mistakes or errors, just show your base maps because that's what you'll be making. Um, and if you've got something, just take like an extra five minutes and anything you've worked on, when you think you're finished, go make a cup of tea, chill out for five, 10 minutes, come back and just spend an extra five, 10 minutes tweaking something. Um, so for instance, in this, it's super simple stuff across the kind of canister in the middle, it says caution, compressed gas. But the thinking is it's been welded together. It's a bit of a weird mock-up, so twist it a bit. There's a good chance whoever's making this in this hypothetical world um, is not going to make sure that their canister letters are perfectly aligned before they weld it all back together. And it just it breaks up the silhouette. It gives you a bit more interest. Um, it's something I try to do in all my models. Um, this is uh, when I was getting a wee bit mad from all the lockdown stuff and I've been doing a lot of cleaning. Uh, I decided to make some kind of post-apocalyptic Hoover-based gun, which I made out of a Dyson. Um, so a lot of what I do is I go in and add all these little details that sell it. So like you've got the, the machine up the top there. It's got the wee willy winky sausage. It's, that's what I was having for lunch that day. It's just these little silly things that make it human. Because if you're thinking about CG, it's so inhuman. You need to add something that makes it relatable, like adding in the straps. It gives you a sense of scale. Um, if I'm making this was like the completely over the top complex opener for the cap. Um, I made a mock-up of this out of cardboard and string just to make sure that if I pulled that string, it would actually work. Most of the time you won't notice it, but it just helps sell the image and it'll take you 30 seconds more. Super easy. Um, same here, weld, string, everything's kind of designed to work. And this is where I go too far, which I wouldn't suggest everybody does, but like even inside of the baitings, there's like kind of the baiting runner balls and everything. I, I like to add in everything I possibly can to make it realistic. Um, totally based on your time scale. If you've got a week to make something, don't do that. Um, if you've got unlimited time because you're locked down and you're going mad, sure, do it. Um, so this is more important ones. And this is definitely do these. I'm using all examples of my own work for these, apart from one, I think. Um, 
this is the stuff that which will stop you getting a job. If you've spent your time making all this cool stuff, followed all the previous advice, um, and then you do these, you've killed all your chances. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones. I see this quite often. So I, when I modeled this, I didn't know how displacement textures worked and um, I was pretty bad at texturing. So I decided to put candlelight in, make it dark and moody. Um, essentially, I was pretending that it was a dark and moody shot so I could hide all my mistakes. It's super obvious when you're doing that. Um, so don't do that. Um, if your model's not looking good and your textures aren't looking good, um, you take it into Photoshop and you put some cool weathering effects and cover the whole thing in smoke again to hide your mistakes. Um, we know what you're doing. Don't do that either. Um, if you're feeling super lazy and you're being cheap and you can't be bothered actually getting a proper HDRI or anything like that and you take a very badly blurred photo from Google and put it as your background and I'm still trying to figure out what I was making in the foreground. I've long since forgotten what that was meant to be. Um, as you can see, badly alpha cut out, all blurred. You can see it's been cobbled together cheaply. Um, don't do that. If you can't afford it, find a different method. It's not about like having to spend money. It's essentially just don't pick an option that looks rubbish. Um, this is, again, back to the why you need to have people that don't like you reviewing your work. This was very much, a, a, I think, a, a friend at the time said, yeah, that's cool. And like, oh, right, okay, that's good enough for me. No. Um, this one is probably the most common one I see at the moment. Is smart materials. Um, just putting a smart material on doesn't make you a textured artist. And it's so obvious. I know like they're called procedural materials, which by definition should mean they're not regular, but it's so obvious when you're using just a smart material. It is like the most regular texture in the world if you don't go in and do some extra tweaking to it. Um, so don't do that. Um, pretending that it's like this is, I see this one quite often. People say, that's my first render or my first project. It's a weird way like you're baking in um kind of accountability essentially like if you put something online or if you put a render out be proud of it like and if you're not proud of it don't put it out don't put in text like that's oh, my first render to try and soften the blow or to make it easier or so people will go more gently on you um if you're not proud of it just don't put it up simple um when you're doing your work You've got 30 seconds. This is the way to think about it. If you're trying to get a job, you've got 30 seconds to capture someone's attention. Um, if you're doing it with images, it works a bit better. Um, with video, you'll have essentially less time because you can tell within about 10 seconds of a demo reel whether it's worth watching the rest of it or not. And the most common mistake that I see, um, which please, for the love of whatever expletive that you fancy putting in there, um, don't put like a 40 second free Premiere Pro transitions pack intro smoke effect with exploding text that you found. You know, put your name, what you're doing straight into your work. Because if you think of that, you got 30 seconds to show off. If in 30 seconds I've seen none of your work, just this weird Premiere thing you found on Google, you're not getting a job. I'm so guilty of it. I think my one of my first reels, it was about 40 seconds of this smoke transition that had absolutely nothing to do with modeling, but I just thought it looked cool and it just completely destroyed my chances of getting a job. Um, always ask yourself if what you're doing is actually research. I quite often find myself like four movies into a binge, which I started off by, I want some research into how to make robots. And then suddenly it's not research, it's just a movie day or like if I'm playing a video game to try and get inspired, um, you know, eight hours in when suddenly I realize like my eyes have turned red, like you're not researching, you're just like playing around and essentially wasting time if that's what you went for. So if you're gonna watch a film or play a game for inspiration, it's something simple, like just having a notepad sitting with you, you don't have to take notes, but just a, something there to remind you that it's not like chilling out time, it's, it's doing stuff time. Um, this is, the worst one, I do this, well, I try not to. I think I meant to say, actually, I don't do it at all if I'm meant to be telling people not to do it, um, but we all do it. Um, it's just making excuses and convincing yourself that your excuse is actually a good reason not to be working. Um, I've fortunately, I have a friend of mine, we came across a pretty good example, I think, um, of it's any time that I'm kind of making excuses, I look back at it and think, yeah, I, I really don't have a good one. Um, this was a project I started with one of my friends. Um, so the idea was for that previous shoe, where we're going to make another version of the shoe that was going to be her design, because I really like her illustrations. Um, so we started sketching stuff out. She's a traditional artist, so I just sent her over a printout of the UV sheet. Um, 
and she lives in a completely different country. So um, when you can't speak to her, there's no way to find out what's going on. So she'd been quiet for a few days. So I'd message her, you know, hey, what's going on? And we're, we're trying to get this project done. Um, and then I got sent a photo of her sitting in a hospital bed. I was like, ah, okay, right? So I feel kind of like a um, not the best person in the world for pushing you as to where the where my sketches were for the project, which there's no money involved in. Um, so I then thought, okay, project's on hold. But this was when I got super impressed at her with her no excuse thing. Like an hour later, she sent me another photo. She'd got her paper brought to the hospital or something and was sitting doodling and sketching away still. Um, and then within a day, we had sketches on a shoe. And by the end of the week, we had a finished project. Um, and I'd never asked her to do that. I don't think I'd ever ask anyone to do that. But any time that I'm, I'm making excuses for myself, I kind of sit back and think like, oh, okay. So like me being a bit tired because I stayed up watching Lord of the Rings for the 500th time is not really an excuse not to do work today. If, like, if that's what my buddy can do. So you really got to think about what your reasonings are, especially um, student style. That's pretty much why I didn't uh, finish college or uni because a lot of my excuses were based on, but there's another phone party tonight and I always went with the phone party option and now I quite wish that I hadn't, but yeah, you, got, you make your own way. Um, important though, don't pigeonhole yourself. Um, going back to that chart before, there are so many different parts to VFX and I think a lot of people get caught in like the cool ones. Like most people have heard of modeling, texturing and animation. Um, so many people don't even know that um, kind of rigging is a thing or layout artists because they're not kind of the rock star type things, I guess, as much as being a VFX artist can be counted as being a rock star. Um, but look into all of them. And if you don't know what you want to do, don't force yourself into one area. Like just because you like modeling, don't force yourself into it. What I'd highly suggest doing is um, becoming a runner. It is one of um, the worst kind of starting jobs on paper because essentially your job is you will be going around the studio cleaning dishes and picking up cups it's, it doesn't sound brilliant but the the amazing side of it which is something no one else apart from runners get access to is you'll be the person who like when a celebrity comes in for something you'll be the one who meets and greets them or brings them their tea or gets to speak and meet to them and, and you get to go around every single department in the building if i'm working i'm in my department all day and that's it then i go to the pub um as a runner, you get to go everywhere. You get to see how everything works. It's a great way if you don't know what your direction is to get a taste of everything whilst also getting paid, um, which is much nicer than sitting trying to figure it out by yourself. Um, and this is what I would say is super important because I, I get asked quite a lot, but people think that because they don't have the right software, they're not going to be able to do the job. It's nonsense. Um, this is, I use Modo. It's my day to day um, because just the way that I went about learning. Um, I have to use Maya for some pipeline things, but I don't work in Maya just because I, I don't like the thousand pie menus to get to making a cube. It just doesn't work for me. Um, I like something more artist friendly. Um, so this is a quick project. I wanted to try out something different. So I see all the 3D printing has been a big trend. So I thought, okay, I'll give that a shot. But I didn't have a lot of time. So this is just a base character that uh, comes with Modo. Then using, it's called Dynamesh. It's basically like a super fancy version of Booleans. Um, this was, I don't know, about two or three hours work. Just essentially just froze that model and cut it apart. And the joy of it that way um, is that you have an airtight mesh you can print. Um, then my OCD bit kicked in and I went in and fully hand retoppled everything because I just hate triangles and engons. You don't have to do that in 3D printing as it turns out. But um, as a modeler, I kind of can't leave that alone. Um, but the advantage of doing something like this is this is actually maybe in total about a week's work. Um, about 95% of it was the retopple, which could have totally been avoided. But just that's, that's my quirk. Um, and at the end, because of the way I've built this with the pins and the dynamesh, everything that I use to intersect and cut this mesh apart with, I've still got those. So I can use those um, for printing, say, as the hinges. You've got a full 3D printable model that looks kind of cool. Um, I guarantee this will not work on first print, but in 3D, um, it should. But it's just something so simple as that. It's like thinking ahead of instead of cutting this apart and then afterwards thinking about how it goes together, think about it beforehand. Um, what I quite often do before I start a project is I'll watch an episode of How It's Made. You can find the whole back catalogue on the internet everywhere. It's a brilliant show that you can... Um, 
it shows you how things are constructed, even like the most simple, bizarre things that you have no care or concern for. And then it just, it kind of puts your mind into this mode of like, okay, how would I have to make this if I was going to make it really? Because you can't just do the CG thing of spend 20 hours modeling it and then think about it later. It just causes you a headache. Um, yeah, and the whole, the whole software debate, you, you see these things everywhere and I have these arguments all the time with students and artists and which one's the best one and you need this one. And each tool has kind of its own cool, useful features, but um, use the thing that works is I've tried most of these. I've worked in um, most of the software here. Um, and uh, no matter what it is, I always go back to Modo because it's the one I can work at full speed in. Um, and that's pretty much what it comes down to is what you can work in quick enough. Um, you're going to have to learn Maya or Max at some point. Um, so just kind of, if you don't like them, you're going to have to suck it up. That's the way I look at it. Like I, I, if I could never use Maya, I would be so happy, but that's not the way the industry works, unfortunately. Um, but you got to find the one that you can work fastest in and then with the joy of like FBX or OBJs you can put it into the studio software and you're good to go and the one that I always like bringing this up for is when people are super curious about software is it doesn't matter what you learn when you go to a studio they're going to have their own software so they might have like a Maya base but they have all their own tools and all their own ways of doing things which there is no way for you to learn until you get a job there so no matter how much you prepare and get ready for it, there's a good chance on day one, you're still not going to know how to do your job when you get there. Um, seems like a silly one, but show your personality. Like a lot of students or um, people starting out in the 3D world, they're kind of treating it like, um, I certainly, I know I did, I used to go to interviews for like art studios when the guy would be sitting in like a Doom t-shirt and I would have gone in like a three-piece suit from Primark that I could just afford, which just looked so weird because you're not working in like an office or something like don't go in your worst ever clothes but you know you've you're an artist you've got a personality show it you're you're creative um is that kind of old expression like you know you don't trust a fat chef um it's like you don't trust a, an artist who doesn't look creative there's just something weird in it um when you're in an the when you're in an interview um you're not there trying to convince them that you're good enough. If you're at that interview, you're already good enough. They've seen your work. They're interested in you. You're just there to sell yourself to them. So don't go into it thinking that you need to speak a thousand miles an hour and tell them every project they've ever made. They don't care. You don't need to. You're already good. Um, but like check your arrogance. Um, this one, I, I see this quite often. And you'll maybe have like one or two people in a class or in a group that will be miles ahead of everybody else. So just something in their brains clicked with that particular VFX thing and they're much better, um, which can in, like, can kind of turn into almost an arrogance, um, which it's not okay, but it's not so bad if you're in a non-professional environment. If you're then going to go to an interview with, say, like somewhere I've worked before, like a frame store, where you're surrounded by some of the best VFX artists in the world, if you go in there with Adigans, um, like it's not going to work. These artists are far better than you are. So if you go in there pretending that you're the big shot, it's just going to give you kind of a bad name. And a VFX is very much um, kind of a close-knit circle. If you mess up at one studio, Every studio will know about it because essentially at the end of the week, everybody ends up at some pub together and we'll be talking about it and it'll come up in conversation. So just, you know, like be, be proud and be um, like proactive in showing yourself, but don't do it to a point when you're just being arrogant. Um, when you're making something, get used to this now as well. It's, just, it's not your baby type thing. Um, when you're making something, um, it's going to get taken by four or five other people, ripped apart, changed, edited, brought back to a different apartment, changed and edited again. Um, it can be really hard when you first get started into like getting used to that because you're so used to, I made this thing, it's mine, nobody can touch it and I'm going to show it off. Um, you need to get that out of your head. Like it's most of the stuff which finally makes it to the cinema screen by the time it's there, it's been through so many hands. It's like you cannot claim it just as your own. That's why I quite often hate, um, if you see in like a demo reel, people will really specifically highlight like a thing that they made and they'll claim it just as their own. It's like, no, it was made as part of a big team. Um, that's just a general good good manner thing. If you're doing a demo reel, like say the thing you were working on, but don't claim sole responsibility for it because you, you didn't do it by yourself. Um, free overtime, um, don't do it. It will completely break you. 
it seems like a good idea, but um, it doesn't make you more employable. It doesn't make you look like a better employee. Um, it makes you look like you have bad time management and your work will also suffer because by the end of the day or by the end of the second day when you're knackered and tired, you're not working to your full ability. So I know it's, it's something I think everybody when they first start feels this need to do. They need to prove themselves. Again, you got the job. You don't need to prove yourself. You just need to do your work properly. Um, now, this is one I've been trying to figure out a way to go around because normally when I go to talks, um, I have this little plastic dude that I call the VFX guy. Um, because what I've discovered over doing all these talks is that uh, as nerds and geeks, it's very hard to talk to people that you don't know. I still find it super weird sometimes at events to go up and speak to people. And I very much get like the imposter syndrome thing. If you're sitting in a room speaking to 200 people afterwards, I don't feel like I can speak to any of them because I'm like, why on earth are you listening to me? I'm just doing something that I like doing. And for some students, it can also be shy for them. So I have the plastic guy that people ask him questions or come and speak to him, which totally doesn't give me any kind of complex at all that nobody speaks to me, but does speak to a three inch bit of plastic sitting beside me. But what I always do um, is... Because I know at a group event like this, it can be hard to have more of like a, an individual approach to things. Is I always put up a little picture, or normally I get people to take a picture. Um, so this is the Instagram tag that I have. Um, what I'll do is you take this picture and you do something cool with it. Some VFX thing. It can be as a group for your uni class or whatever. It can be a personal project. Just do something cool VFX with it. And then if you tag it back to that Instagram page, Whoever does the coolest one or whichever one catches my eye the most, I'll give you an hour of time for whatever you want. As long as it's legal, I have to I somehow have to add that in um, a few talks ago. It got kind of weird. Um, so, yeah, you have an hour of time for whatever you want to review your work, to help you make something. Um, maybe just sort of chat about VFX, whatever it is, um, you get an hour of time. So if you want it as an option, it's there. Um, I'll put a link in the chat to the, the page for that. And with that, that is the end of all the slides I've got for today. So I think hopefully we've got some, some questions. I like to think we've got some questions. I've got Jake helping us with some questions. Hey, sorry, hopefully you can hear me. You can't see me, but you should be able to hear me. Well, I can hear you. voice in the distance. <laughs> so let's have a little look at what we've got. Um, okay, so we've got a question here from Shantai who says, as a 3D modeler, how do you start laying out your topology for the models you create, whether that is a character topology or environment modeling topology? I guess they're both quite different, but hopefully you can shed some insight on that. Pretty much the same thing once you get going. Um, I generally will look at the piece that I'm working on. If it's not complicated, I don't think about topology till the end. If it's something quite um, complex, I'll try and model everything that I can flat. Um, with no 3D dimension to it at all. And I don't lay out my main topology then. I just make sure that things work um, and I make sure I can get all my key shapes in. Essentially, you're building the silhouette first. And then what I normally do is if I can't work on the piece itself, because maybe it's like there's a lot of round shapes on it, I'll freeze the subdivision and then I will do my retopple on top of that with like a nice layout. Um, and I normally always start with circles. So if you've got circles on a mesh, start with them and work out because there's a bad tendency that you'll build all your re all your topo that will then come into a circle and you'll have like a 300 sided circle for a screw hole because all your topology is flowing into it. Um, if you work backwards, you'll have like a 12 sided circle and you'll be fine. Um, and on a corner, um, there's kind of the two ways of going about it. Um, you kind of you have a loop that flows directly around the outside. Um, I'd always try and do on a corner or an edge where you have your weird topology joining. Like if you have five edges coming together, move it two loops away from the finished edge. Does that make sense? So you have your corner and then a loop and then another loop and then where your topo joins up. So that way you don't get any um, kind of distortion or weird twisting or pulling on the corner of the edge itself. Um, it's kind of hard to describe with words, but um, yeah, just work circles out. And if you're having weird topology, make sure it doesn't join at an edge or a corner or on a rounded surface. Try and keep it somewhere where it's not important if it's a bit weird. 
I thought, yeah, I think, yeah, topology is quite a hard thing to describe, isn't Absolutely. it? It's more of a visual yeah. thing, but yeah, <laughs> it's quite cool. Um, okay, so Joe asks, um, what's your opinion on the Unreal Engine since films, TV shows are now start, starting to use the program because of the Mandalorian? It's currently the reason I have bags under my eyes because uh, I've just started a new job in games because uh, films ain't so hot at the moment. Um, and initially I was totally not into it because like um, low res stuff is kind of the opposite of what I like to do, but having actually used Unreal now and seen what it's capable of, um, it's super impressive. I think they could, like, there's a, a good video, I think it recently came out from Weta, and uh, it was like a show off with meerkats. I think they need to make more stuff like that because everything Unreal that I've seen is games based and for a film mindset, that's totally an off put. So if, like, if you're... You know, if you're working in Unreal, make some cool thing that looks film res and like you'll be the person's YouTube channel that everyone comes to and you can be like the, the hero who started it all. That might be a way to go. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Um, okay, so I've got another question here that says, um, about how many pieces is recommended in a reel? And does it matter to only have hard surface um, or would that lack a chance if you, do not, if you don't show much organics? Thank you, I'm currently updating my reel. Um, it kind of goes to how good your pieces are. Um, don't have a reel over two minutes. Um, if you've only got one piece, don't have a two minute reel with one piece, break it into like 30 seconds. Um, I'd maybe, if you're starting out, go for like three or four pieces. Um, and when it's coming to, if you want to be organic or, um, hard surface, you kind of got to pick what path you want to follow. If you want to be a generalist and work in smaller scale studios or in games, make both for a generalist reel. If you want to become like a film artist, you don't move around a lot. So you'll move into film as a hard surface artist or a character artist, not both. So pick the one that you really want to pursue um, and put those in. Like I wouldn't worry about having like a lot of cool mixes of characters and monsters and hard surface in it's Just the stuff that you want to do is what you need to have in there. Yeah, perfect. Makes sense. Um, so uh, I've got Logan here who's asked, what made you take an interest towards modeling in the first place? Like, why'd you get into it? Um, this is a really cool question. If you get a boss at any place you start, um, all VFX will end up in the pub, no matter what you do. Um, so it's a good question when you end up sitting with your bosses, asking them how they got started and everybody's got like their weird little story of like their first one. And for me, it was like um, an old copy of Lightwave um that one of my mum's friends showed me how it worked and I discovered that I could make sand castles without having to persuade my parents to take me to the beach I could just sit in a cupboard and and make sand castles and that for me was made modeling like the best thing in the world because I could get what I wanted without having to persuade someone to give me it and maybe not the best example in the world but that was pretty much my moment when I was like yep I'm going to be a modeler um I was quite I think I was quite lucky in that respect because I've known since I started that that's the only thing I want to do I've not had uh, like a what is a bit different stuff. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, great. So Kibi asks, um, do you or how do you tailor models or a reel to a client? Um, the, the, the slide that I had in there, don't tailor the model to them, just put a texture on it. Or if you're just going to go with pure modeling, like put their logo and text on it as a 3D asset. Um, it's not really something you have to do. Um, a lot of the time you'll get hired based on like an individual piece. When I first got my job at Framestore, it was because of a 3D car that I did a while ago that was made of very intricate, weird, complicated pieces. They just saw that and it matched up with what they needed. Um, there's not really anything you can do to super tailor your reel because they'll hire people based on what kind of films they have coming in and you don't know what those are. So just you know, make try to make something that's not just a gun or not just a car because everybody does those and they're super like everywhere. Um, just try and make something a bit more interesting. Or try and make something that could be maybe like cyberpunk style that can cross a lot of genres because you've got modern and weird and industrial. Like if you make a piece like that, that covers a lot of different topics, that's going to be super useful too. Cool. Yeah. Just think to stand out, I guess. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we've got Connor here who says, um, what do you see too often in other people's showreels that you think they should change out um, for something more interesting? Yeah, I guess uh, that's kind of what you just said. <laughs> Guns. 
And um, the, this one that I have a lot that drives me mad is um, transitions between videos. You get loads of like cool like dubstep video camera shake transition things that totally ruin clips that you're watching. It's just, you know, have, have things that flow nicely that show off your work. Just don't hide it with weird transitions and effects. It's not worth it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I've got a question here from Chloe, who I think might have seen you at the York Film Festival last year. Um, she asks, how is your little figure doing now? You can't take it to talks in person <laughs> or for a photo opportunity. Um, at the moment, he doesn't have a lower half because uh, I quite recently got a puppy and the puppy decided that that was a toy he wanted. So he, at the moment he's in surgery, um, I'm still trying to find parts of him. So as soon as I've found all of them, or if, I suppose if all of them ever comes out, um, he'll be doing fine. <laughs> cool. Okay, so um, Majib asks, do you think it's necessary to be profic proficient at both soft body and hard body modeling as a 3D modeler, or is it enough to be good at one? Um, again, it depends on what you want to do, but the way to think about it is I've done, I don't know what, like 10 nine or 10 films at Framestore and I've never once modeled anything organic for any of them because I just am not good at organic modeling. I focused in on what I wanted to do. Um, if when you're getting started, it's worth uh, a worthwhile skill to have because um, you can get more generalist roles, but it's again, it's just dependent on what you want to do. Like you, in a big studio, you don't do both. You do one, you got to choose. Yeah, cool, makes sense. Um, okay, so we've got uh, Maximus who has asked, what software did you use to model and construct the Lego car? How did you plan the animation? I'm really big on Lego and would love to know how to model something like that. Um, I, I'd advise you to not do something like that, to be honest, um, unless you're feeling like really punishing yourself. Um, but for that one, I, I model everything in Modo because that's just what I know how to use. Um, for that, I downloaded uh, an instruction manual for a thing that if you go on the Lego website, you can download all the instruction manuals, um, but everything's a weird orthographic view. So there's another website, you know, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, you'll find it in Googling. It shows you the mathematical rules for how the spacings between the holes and joints need to be for Lego pieces. And from that, just figuring out how to build the pieces in the instruction manual, literally went through and built it in 3D as you would in real life, like page by page and then animated it in reverse by having it built and then having pulling everything apart and laying it out nicely and then rendering it and putting the video in reverse so it looked like it was getting built. Cool, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen this, actually. I've seen, like, a, there's a plugin you can get for Maya called Brickit that's got lots and lots of different little Lego bricks yeah. that you can just import. But that, that's, for me, I don't like stuff like that because there's no topology in it, and I'm a total stickler for topology. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, so Chloe has asked, um, do you think it's fine to showcase both stylized and realistic pieces in one portfolio to show you're capable of both games and VFX, or do you think it's best to keep them separate? Well, I mean, if they're, if they're good and you're proud of them, show them. Cool. Yeah, good advice. Um, okay, so we've got Sam who has asked, what work are you most proud of? Ooh. I've got a split decision on that one at the moment because my favourite work that I've made uh, was for Wonder Woman, but I'm not a fan of the film and a huge section of what I made didn't make the final cut. So it's like my proudest work that I've made, but it also is just non-existent and in a film that I'm not really a fan of. Um, so I think at the moment, probably a lot of the modelling I did for Tom and Jerry because it's the most fun film I've seen in a while. Um, it, pretty much every like year, your favorite thing will change, and it's essentially based on the last thing that you made. Uh, I think Alita was probably my favorite for a while because I really want to work for Weta at some point. So having an opportunity to work with them was like a wee giggly dream come true. Um, but I think just Tom and Jerry for now because it's lots of bright colors and you can watch it without needing to have your brain turned on, which is quite handy. <laughs> Do you find it quite frustrating? Like you just said that a lot of what you did didn't actually make the final cut. Is that? quite frustrating do you find that happens quite often yeah it happens a lot um there's like um i think i was going to do like a 15 second sequence in that film that was made um it was all modeled textured laid out there was animation in it vfx it was a full full heavy shot that just didn't make the final cut at all and um, that quite often happens or and when we're working on thor and um, there's that sakar is the city that's made out of junk and um, i think i was working on that for four months 
and then because of our um, our budget of time, um, we moved on to making um, like Asgard all Odin's Tower, and all the work that we'd done for the Junk City got sent to another studio who finished it, and because they finished it, it's their work, so they get the full the full claim of all the modeling and texture and everything. That's theirs to claim, and we can't claim it. That can be a bit frustrating, but. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I can pay my rent and I get to make something I like. That's kind of the way I look at it is I'm enjoying what I'm doing and I'm being able to feed myself. So I don't really care anymore. So I guess you've kind of got to get used to it and you can uh, live your oh, life. Yeah, the, first, <laughs> the first time breaks your heart, but then after that, you're just hollow inside. So it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so Dominica has asked, uh, when creating very complex models or through the environments, do you often use procedural methods? I generally don't use any procedural stuff because it's just not the way that I've learned to do things. I'm starting to introduce it into my workflow now because it's becoming kind of a necessity. Um, I'd say like the one bit of software that I would suggest that everybody starts looking into is Houdini. Um, that's starting to become very persuasive, um, pervasive. Um, but I more go with like kind of like a mathematical approach to when I'm modeling things. I'll make everything at origin. I'll try and figure out how to make the smallest section of it and then just replicate it or like if it's a, a wheel make one spoke and spin it around just make sure that i've got the topology in there at the start um if you if you've got a, a procedural mind you're going to model a lot faster than me so if you can do it go for it but it's kind of like a mindset thing i find and it just i don't know i think it's, it's going to become like the like the old guy complaining about you know oh you youngsters with your procedural modeling it's going to become that kind of thing <laughs> okay um, so we've got Michael here has asked a question that's very similar to the one you just answered. So it might be a different answer, it might be the same. But he says, um, "What was your the favourite film that you've worked on?" Um, Thor Ragnarok's the favourite film I've ever worked on. It wasn't my best work ever, but it was just such a fun production um, for just every aspect of it. Everybody enjoyed working on it, and the director Taika Waititi, um, he's one of the characters. He's Korg, like a rock guy in it. So he had a very keen interest in the VFX side of it, which meant that things were filmed properly or were planned out for VFX. And because quite often you'll get film stuff in and then the VFX is an afterthought and your life is much more difficult because it wasn't filmed with the intention of having a VFX in it. I think that one, because it was just, it was like the perfect storm of everything just working nicely together. I've never worked on a production like it since. Cool, thanks. Okay, so Connor's asked... Um, how did you manage to reach out to major studios working on big, big projects such as Marvel? Did you get seen or were you connected through studios or was it being seen through your portfolio? Um, this bit's definitely not good advice because I have no idea. I moved to Poland for a while. I was working out there um, for a, a company making 3D furniture, which I'm still not entirely sure how that ended up happening. Um, but um, in Poland, the... Um, the prices at the pub are a lot a lot more favorable than they are here so i uh, i enjoyed my first couple of months there a bit too much and at some point in time i got a response from framestore to an application that i don't remember sending to them which was of my showreel um and it is a um in my showreel there's a thing a thing it's called the mad professor's car and that just happened to match what they were looking for it was just pure luck they were looking for people who could make that kind of stuff and i had an example of it and that was it. And a good one is people think, think about moving to studios. If you've got to move country to a different studio and if they like you, they pay you to move. Um, so like, I think for Frames or like from them messaging me to me working was like a week and I'd moved from Poland to London and they pay for it. So if you're worried about not living close to a studio, don't worry about it. They help you. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, Sam has asked, what resources did you mainly um, use when you were self um, teaching yourself 3D? Um, I, I mean, it's not not um, good advice, but uh, a lot of torrents. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of like a weird understanding, I think, with software companies that uh, there's a there's a talk that Adobe gave on it about Photoshop that they're aware of how much pirating is done, and there's kind of like a certain percentage of it allowed. Um, as I don't know any student in the world who's got like two and a half, three thousand pounds spare to download a bit of software to find out if they like it or not. So 
essentially to get started i downloaded everything in ways i probably shouldn't have tried everything out for like two weeks a month um and then I picked the one I like. And fortunately now it's a lot more common for there to be like 30 day trials and things like that or student licenses. So definitely go that route. But um, rather than pick a single resource, just download and try as many as you can until you find one that suits. That's pretty much my approach to kind of like a, 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 a wide shot and just see what sticks. Cool, okay, thank you. Um... Okay, so I've got, an, uh, I think there's another question from Connor who's asked, uh, when working on something like Wonder Woman, do you take responsibility on a scene to carry out a task on your own or do you work with a team for each sequence? How it worked for that is you have a calendar. Um, the calendar will essentially become kind of like your Bible of life. It's You don't get to choose what goes in there. It's essentially, it will say, this is your task. You have three days, it is due then and then your next task is there and your next task is there. Um, and what I'd suggest, and like, that's a good way of working, but it's very closed off. If you get stuff like that in a studio is, this is, I'm gonna keep bringing up the pub, which maybe probably shouldn't, but it's a super important place, is make friends with like every different department. Because if you make a model and you've got to go have like rig and fix it or texture and hate what you've done, it's gonna be so much easier if you're friendly with the people, because it's quite a closed industry. Um, so what I'd normally do is if I'm making something, I'll get that thing in my calendar, which I should make in kind of isolation, but I'll then generally start it up and I'll like go grab a coffee or like meet someone after work who's going to be the rigging artist who gets it. And it's like, hey, is there anything in particular you need me to add to this model or anything that I should avoid to make it an easier task or work better for you? Um, that does kind of happen at the dailies meetings, but normally the dailies meetings are so rushed because everybody wants to talk and there's just not time to do it. So it's very much uh, like, like kind of got to go on your own initiative. If you're making something, you think it could affect someone, go visit them, make them a cup of tea, buy them a chocolate, whatever you've got to do to butter them up for the mistakes that you know you're going to send them. Um, because when you start getting your work and you'll start your next model or whatever it is once you finish your previous one, but that doesn't mean you're finished with the previous one. When the mistake happens, it'll come back and you've got to fix that while you're still doing the next thing in your schedule. And by the end of the film, you're juggling like 10 different things. Um, so you kind of just pick the team members that are important to you and be friendly to them. Maybe I think that answers it. <laughs> cool, so it's good to be nice. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> um, so a question from Joe who says, um, speaking of Tom and Jerry, did you get to watch loads of the original cartoons to give you inspiration when you were working on it? And um, that slide that I had earlier on about is it research? Um, that's kind of where that one came from recently. Because yes, I watched a lot of Tom and Jerry, um, and none of it was for research. It was just for the sheer giggles of it. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got a question from Chloe who asks: um, If it doesn't, if the shot you've been working on doesn't make the cut, can you still include it in your show reel, or would you need to wait for them to release an extended version, for instance? It depends on the studio, but a basic rule of thumb, if it's not public, you can't use it. Okay. Um, do you like, normally have to wait for at least to sh um, the film to be released as well to include it? Yeah, like um, I think you have to wait until it's been like, released in DVD before you can use it properly. <clears throat> be a, long, like my... a long, frustrating wait sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I mean, some films as well will never let you use it. Like I've got um, a lot of work when I first started for Halo 4, which I still can't use to this day because the company just doesn't want them to show the work and stuff. It's, it's studio dependent. Um, it, it, sometimes like it, for work on Thor and Infinity War, there are breakdown reels which I can use showing the working. For most of the other films I've worked on, there are no breakdown reels, so you can't show it. Um, a studio is like a closed environment. You can't take stuff in or out really for security purposes. So it's kind of, if it's not on a DVD or on a cinema screen, um, you can't use it. Have you ever just um, plugged in your USB into the computer and <laughs> taken wireframe renders? <laughs> um, well, they're disabled. Um, but there's people who've done it and there's kind of like, um, there's a few, a few pretty heavy cases of it. There's a few recently, I think it was it. MPC, I think they were, and essentially what they do is they they sue you for such a high amount that you can never possibly dream of paying it. And if you essentially if you can't pay the fine, you then get blacklisted as option B. And because nobody can ever pay for it, you just get blacklisted, which means you never work again. So it's worth just not doing that. 
<laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like <laughs> a good option, to be fair. <laughs> okay, so um, Alec has asked, when working in the company, do you have to work with the program that they choose, or can you model in um, like software of your choice as long as you're doing good work? I'd say, uh, well, again, it can be slightly company dependent, um, but I always fight really hard against being forced to use a piece of software, not just to be like a rebellious pain in the bum, but just I like where you're an artist, you know, like um, you, the, the tool should work for you. If you want to be creative, you've got to use the right tools. Like, you, know, you can't use like a screwdriver to battle, battle a, um, a nail into a bit of wood. It just doesn't work. So like, I, I don't like it when companies force you to use it exclusively. I get that we will have to use like say Maya for like uh, custom pipeline tools that they have, but your work needs to go through to get to the finished film. But I don't see why it has to be created in that because there are so many open formats that you can move between programs. That there's no reason to keep it so closed apart from maybe studio licensing, but I can guarantee that most 3D software costs a whole lot less for a license than a Maya license. Yeah, makes sense. So I guess as long as it can eventually go through the pipeline it doesn't matter too much yeah. normally okay great i think we've got one final question um and this is from tom who says how interchangeable are modeling skills learned in the game industry and in vfx so in game production we are taught to make models as low poly as possible so they optimize for engines is there more freedom in vfx work um i've never had a poly count in vfx so yeah now that i've started working in games uh, that has been that's been an interesting transition um, like for instance, the stuff on Wonder Woman, um, the models that I made were essentially, I kept modeling until the PC couldn't handle them being able to display an open GL anymore. And then that was when a model was complete. Cause like I'd used like 64 gig of Ram and that was it. We were finished because then you ship that model off and it goes on to the, the, the render farm and the amazing computer that you never get to see magically finishes it. Like there is no real time constraint. I can make something and it can leave it rendering for a week and that's fine. It doesn't have to be real time. And um, so for going to games, it has been a complete mind twister for me. Um, I'm still working in the same way I used to work, but I'm having to adjust it, like making high res then going down to low. I think no matter what one you're doing, it's a good idea to start with a high res model because then you can bake all your details down onto a low res one and you'll have naturally better topology because you're not starting with triangles and working up. You start with nice geometry, then turn it into triangulated mesh and then bake down. Um, and one that I've come across quite recently that I'm going to be using way too much because it's my way of working like in films is for like um, 3D decals or trim sheets seems to be the best way to get really high resolution detail into a low res model that still looks like something I'd want to make. So I think there's like a, a program called Decal Machine. This for Maya and for Blender, I believe. If you have a look into that, it's, it looks like a good way to kind of cross between the two disciplines. Perfect, thank you very much. Well, uh, I, had one, I had one question. It's like, what do you think the lasting impact is going to be on the uh, the working practices of VFX artists after COVID? Do you think there's going to be a wide scale return to the studios because of protecting IP, or do you think that it's awoken a new way of working and they might stick with it in some way? I really hope it's awoken like a a new way of working. Um, I'd think that logically it would have to be like a half and half. I'd think. Um, is the way I think I could see it most working is you could work in isolation on your particular model, say Monday to Wednesday, working from home, then go into the, the studio for the last two days of the week, where you would then bring your model onto like the company network. And that's where it would be the more of the, the kind of um, proprietary stuff where the stuff that you can't share or have accessible. I think that would be a good way to do it. Because at the moment I'm working on a VPN, so I can't download or share stuff anyway. Um, but there's still the risk of you can show people so I think you know, make it in isolation and then that two days in the studio, that's when you do the kind of secret sauce stuff. That would be awesome. Uh, as long as, um, as I've been noticing recently, as long as there was some way that the, the studio would start paying towards like your electricity bill, because um, it's something I'm, I'm kind of curious to see if it will happen in the future. Is now that, you know, they're, if three days a week, nobody's in the studio, the company is not paying to heat or light or less overheads. Yeah. But whereas I am paying to do that individually, but it would normally be something they'd do. So like, I'm not expecting them to heat or light the place, but it'd be good if there was like a wee something extra in your wage to be like, this is towards the power bill because you know, you're using all your own equipment. 
Um, and that's the danger of it as well is if you're not getting a computer from them, you're burning through your own equipment. Like it's a big personal cost. It's essentially you're not working in a studio, you're a freelance artist, which has a whole different set of ways. It's amazing. And you work on your own setup. There's no, the, the, the companies don't support you in any way, shape or form taking those out. At the moment, I'm a contractor. Um, so it would be your I, own. I only get my, it's just my own equipment. Um, and if you work for the company, they'll sometimes give you a PC or laptop. I think it's company dependent. Um, but I'd, I mean, I could see, unfortunately, a lot of VFX is very financially driven. So I could see any avenue that they could possibly find to save a penny. They will probably take it, even if it's at the detriment to artists. Um, so if they can save buying new PCs because people have got their own, I could unfortunately see that becoming a case and there being some kind of rebate in your wage or something or a small like the, the minimum legal amount required to compensate you for using your own equipment i could see that becoming a thing okay is there no more questions there's no more questions that was it well, I okay see. we're all good that's absolutely brilliant so thank you for all of your insight uh, I'm, I'm sure it's very useful to all the students uh, i'm sure they uh, had a great time so thank you once again rue thank you for your time